Hi, everyone. <laughs> Aw, you know my name. That's so nice. Welcome to the panel about sad things. Not totally sad things. Don't dream it's over. What fans do when long-running franchises come to an end. And we have a gaggle of various perspectives on this subject. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go down and like ask everyone to talk about this like a little bit to do with their expertise. And then we're going to see if they can like talk to each other and maybe argue. OK? <laughs> cool. All right. So our first brilliant expert is Craig Titley. Craig works on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which you guys probably know. Formerly. Yeah. Well, it's ending. There's still, you can still like be part of this for a little bit. Mm -hmm. No? OK. Um, so all right, could you tell us a little bit about what it's like to come to the end of a TV show? So from a pro's perspective, right, other than Save Our Show campaigns, what can people do to try and show their support, to encourage more stuff? Like, even if it's something like comic books, novels, what's helpful, what's not helpful? Yeah, I mean, well, one thing, we were blessed with like great fans and great fan support. And uh, I think we were all sad that uh, it had to come to an end, but uh, we brought it to an end on our own terms. Uh, I think the, you know, the way fans can support is obviously the show is not going to come back. That's definitive. Uh, but there are things that we were talking about doing. Uh, Jed mentioned in our panel we might do like a comic book series that explains where uh, Simmons and Daisy had been uh, on their search for Fitz. Uh, and so I think when things like that come out to show your support, you, you just love it. and. It sounds crass to buy it, but, but uh, that's how the powers that be dictate or, or see support in a project. And uh, there are many things. You can, you can keep writing letters to the creators, writing letters to Marvel, like, we miss Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Are there any other things? Because, you know, in Marvel, there are animated films, there are comic books, there are many, many things that can be done to keep uh, the story alive and keep the characters alive. So is that more helpful to like write a letter specifically as opposed to like whatever a, a fan petition or something like that typically? Yeah, I mean, I don't think this is the, this is not necessarily the scenario for a fan petition because we weren't canceled. Uh, right. We told the story we wanted to tell, which was seven season arc. We ended it where we wanted to end it. So in this particular scenario, that wouldn't help. But uh, you know, writing to Marvel just. You know, staying in touch with uh, the social media of Agents of Shield, which won't go away, like the Instagram site, and showing that there's still love out there for the series and characters, and that you know, then they'll get to live on in other ways, other media, other forms. Right. So you gave me literally the best segue in the entire world <laughs> into into Justin, who has been working on Star Wars, which, as we all know, has had its share of various stories coming to an end in various social media excitements to do with, with that. So could you tell me a little bit about like some of the constructive and destructive reactions, both, that you see on social media when something's coming to an end? Like, what's helpful, what, like from the perspective of like actually getting the thing you ideally want, which is probably more of your thing, right? What, what's helpful and what's not helpful? Sure. Anything con counterintuitive? Yeah. Um First, to specify, I worked on Star Wars social media, not on Star Wars. I feel like the two are very different things. <laughs> one is a really cool job. One is a pretty good job. Um, so to answer your question, uh, things I've seen, I guess the best way to describe it is I've always thought of social media as kind of a microcosm of the world around us. And it's, it's always funny to me to come to conventions because all of a sudden, it's like social media is real. Everyone you talk to on social media is there. There's someone from social media that I know well, right now. <laughs> um, that's real too, by the way. Um, and you have to interact with the people that you talk to all of the time, but it's in person, which fundamentally, I think, changes the dynamic. And I think to your question about what to do and what not to do, I try to be the way I am in my actual life on social media. Um, whether that's saying things that people would agree with or wouldn't agree with, um, you want to be yourself, but you don't want to make it seem like you're the only person who really matters. And that's what I would say not to do. Um, just like you wouldn't go up to somebody cosplaying as Captain America and say, I really hate Captain America. I don't know why anyone would cosplay this person, 
why are you going to call out somebody online who's really into something and, and saying something that they like or something that they love? So that's really the reaction that I would, I would suggest that people have, which is just interacting with people in a way that you would interact with them in real life. I think it gets dangerous when you do, again, think that you're the only person in the room who matters and you take it upon yourself to force your perspective on someone else. Um, Star Trek has a great saying that I love, uh, IDIC, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. I think that's a great rule to live by both in real life and most definitely on social media because that stuff has a shelf life that I think at this point is going to outlive all of us. So does that, does that also apply to like if, if people are going strongly negative on something like, like a fan petition or like a you know, demand, that impact, like that makes it less likely to happen? Is that true? The thing you want, whatever it is, if you've gone really negative? <laughs> I think what Craig really said that I keyed into pretty early is you were talking about it, that it sounded crass to say buy it. And I understand you don't want to be that shill who's out there saying, hey, guys, we made this thing. Please give us your money so that we can have it. Um, but I started in my path to where I work now by being a podcaster and a blogger. And one of the first things that I really learned and I tried to apply to all of the, the podcasts and the, the articles I would write is always keep in mind that it's a business. I think that if you have that perspective, it kind of lets you go in open hearted, but clear eyed about what it is you're interacting with. And honestly, the best way to support it is because it's a business with your money. Um, and I think that there's a very fine line between being crass as you're saying, and that definitely happens sometimes, but there's a right way to do it. And I think that if fans keep that it's a business in mind, you can really come up with creative ways of supporting that product, not being taken advantage of, and I think more likely than not, you'll see that that thing comes back in one way or another because people see the value in it because you'll, you'll support it. All right, so that also leads in, so Lynn, you are a psychologist by trade, and you also are currently experiencing the emotional turmoil of your fandom, Supernatural Ending. Could you talk a little more about that <laughs> like, emotional experience, which I think probably drives both the positive and the negative behavior that, that Justin's been talking about? It does. It definitely, definitely drives the positive and the negative, unfortunately. You can't have sort of passion and have passion go in the positive direction and then expect not to have passion that sometimes goes in the negative direction. So that, that makes sense. But I mean, this, this is an emotional experience because it really is important to people. And I probably don't have to sell that to anyone in the room. You know, when you're fanish about something, it is really important to you. It's part of your identity. It's you relate to the characters that you fan, and that's part of how you develop and explore who you are, whether it's through just you know the stories that we relate to or identifying in some way like cosplay and taking on some of the attributes of those characters. That's kind of core identity development, so that's really important. And then there's also the community aspect of it, which is also really important. There's nothing more important to humans than belonging. We literally, you know, back in the day, if you didn't belong to the group, you were eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or whatever. You were literally dead. So there's nothing more terrifying for humans than the threat of the group that they feel they belong to being taken away. So when we're faced with the ending of something that we really relate to and that's become really important to us, it's literally a loss. And humans don't really do that well with loss, and we especially don't do very well with losses that are, psychologists would call them disenfranchised losses, which are losses that are not really recognized by people. So, you know, you, you can say to your significant other or your family or your coworkers, you know, oh my God, I'm so depressed, Supernatural announced that it's going off the air in a year, but a lot of them are gonna come back and go, uh, get a grip, that's a television show, not your family. But that's not how it feels to us. So it, it is emotional and it is important. All right. So speaking of emotions, <laughs> Joelle, I, I know that, that you're a film critic and you do journalism, but you also just came off of Game of Thrones. I sure did. Which had a lot of feelings. So many. Right? So, okay. Like, so many people were really upset by the last mm. bit of that show. And I'm sure that makes the transitions even weirder. 
So just to make a slight transition away from like how do you get more of the thing and into like how do you deal with the thing coming to an end, maybe in yeah. a way you did or didn't like, what are some of the strategies people are using, good and bad? Like, yeah. what do you think? Well, a lot of people, as we've seen a result of at this con, <laughs> wanted to lash out at the creators. I don't think that that's ever appropriate as a film critic. One of the tent poles of my profession is I try to treat everything with the knowledge that people intended to make something that was really great. I don't think anybody like goes to sit down and is like, I hate these fans, burn them. Uh, maybe somebody does, uh, but I, I don't ever want to start from that perspective. Um, my outlet has been fan fiction. It is a, yes, it is a self-gratifying way of engaging in the content that you love. Um, and you can key search the things that you want, the outcomes you want, the relationships you want, um, the like maybe you hated season four, but season two was like your bread and butter. You can like go directly into that season and try to relive parts that maybe the show didn't give you, but somebody else who had that same connection or has felt that same emotional thread will bring that out really beautifully. And I was telling we were waiting in a Hall H line the other day, uh, my headcanon for Harley Quinn could not be further away from what actually exists on the page. <laughs> because I, my introduction to the character outside of Batman the Animated Series was in college. My roommate, um, fabulous woman, Brittany, was like obsessed with the character. And she's like, here's a stack of fan fiction, and this is what I love about Harley Quinn. And that's how I got into her. Um, so I think that there's something really great that the fans have done in saying, you know, we're not always going to get what we want out of the shows we love, but we can turn to one another and create really great stories uh, that become almost, if not more important than the original source material. All right, so going from, going from fanfic over to official continuations, Delilah, you've worked on so many different things. Um, you have, what are your, your current books out? Are, you've got like a Star Wars book right now that you're doing and you're working on a Firefly comic, is that right? Yep. Um, I actually, you know, I'm an, I'm an 80s kid, so I got to watch lots of the things I love go dormant like a cicada and rise 17 years later. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, My Little Pony and Care Bears, they're back. Labyrinth, <laughs> it's back. Um, I am waiting on my never-ending story reboot. Like, I'm here for it Woo! after Stranger Things, right? So it's this amazing thing where things I thought were dead are, like, rising, like, pleasant rainbow-hued zombies. Dark Crystal's <laughs> coming back? Dark Crystal, yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, everything I do um, is, is like official canon in these worlds, and I'm, I'm basically like Santa's helper elf. So, you know, Santa shows up and tells me to make a rocking horse, I make a rocking horse. So when Firefly comes to me, they don't say, what do you want to do? They say, here's what we want. Can you do it? And I say yes or no, and the same thing with Star Wars. Um, so with Firefly, it's a graphic novel that's um, Firefly comes to the women, and it's an all-lady heist. So it's Ocean's 8 and Firefly. It's like a 110-page graphic novel. Which is like, it's a dream project because the, you know, the business is, right? Um, <laughs> freaking out. I'm going to keep it in. It's fine. It's fine. It's really exciting. We can, it's okay. We can freak out. But, you know, it's, it's, they're really good at matching writers that they trust, that can, they know can do the work with stories that are, that are right for them. Nobody came to me and was like, we want to see Jane's origin story. Like, they were like, no, ladies kicking ass. Um, but that also means, like, you know, you're talking about things not to do. Um, I, I would gently encourage you lovingly to reach out in ways that don't harm up-and-coming creators. Um, as in, don't go yell at Santa's elves because of what Santa chose to do. Um, I have this new creator-owned comic with IDW called Starpig, and the day they announced it, like, hundreds of Winona Earp fans responded to this announcement with, we don't care, do justice for Winona. And I respect that because I once stumbled into a Winona Earp party and they were so nice and welcoming and they gave me whiskey and cake, so I love them. <laughs> but I don't think they had, they were aware that there was like this little baby creator with their very first creator in comic with IDW that got hit with 300 messages that said, we don't care. And like, I'm a woman writing a strong woman. So, you know, I feel like love is so good, but just remember like the people that might be on the end of it, um, you know, or also people like I wrote the Phasma book and people, you know, were like, well, why don't you write about Kylo Ren? And I'm like, they didn't offer me that. <laughs> they didn't come to me and say, would you like to write Kylo Ren? And I was like, no, no, no. Like we do what we're told and we're people and we love it as much as you do. Cause like you can't write Star Wars if it's not in your blood. Like it, it's just not even possible. So we love the love and it's so good. And like the, the fandom is so amazing. Like the Kylux people in Star Wars are like, I'm there with you. I want to make Millicent canon one day. <laughs> that's fascinating. It sounds like you're in a position that's quite, um, 
I guess difficult for a lot of fans to comprehend in terms of I'm a fan of this thing, but I'm going to go and, and write the thing that they tell me to write, and hopefully it's something I like. But I'm yeah, gonna it's like it. a minor god, but like we respect the fans. Like we want the fans to be to be happy. Like in Phasma, there's like a line about Hux being on an ice blue couch in a crisp blue robe, and now I'll see like bathrobe Hux will come see me, and I'm like, oh my god, it's bathrobe Hux. <laughs> <laughs> like we want you to be happy. <laughs> That's delightful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Elizabeth, my podcasting partner, rounding this out. Um, Hi, Marsh. Yeah. How are you doing? Rounding this out. How are you doing? Fine. Great. Glad to hear it. All right, so you are fanfic focused also, but you're also like in X Men first class fandom, which sort of is a, yeah. you know, that's a thing that people have been writing about and uh, kind of to various degrees ignoring or. or getting into or ignoring the canon for a, a while now. Could you talk a little more about that difference between like canonical extensions of things versus fanfic, like what they're for, what they're, you know, what, what each thing is that's different? Sure, I mean, absolutely. I think it's, uh, the, the world of transformative works and fan fiction in particular is, is vast. Um, and depending on the source material, depending on the various groups writing, it can focus on different stuff. In, in this particular instance, I think a lot of really good writers showed up for X-Men First Class and that really set the tone about the works that continue to get created even though more movies are coming out. Um, and it's, it's interesting because looking at the rest of this panel, so, so much of this work is, is we, we talk a lot on the podcast about how transformative works are divorced from the cycles of capitalism. And I'm really feeling this hard on this panel because you, know, you have people who are, we, we have friends who are like leading the Inception fandom, right? Which is a movie that came out in 2010. You know, and they, and they are bringing people in, and there's not going to be another, there's probably not going to be another Inception film, right? <laughs> but, you know, you have people writing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of words, millions of words, bringing people in just because of the force of their transformative works. That doesn't actually connect back to the, to the creator side in any way. And I think that's what makes it really hard for people who are outside of transformative fandom to understand how, how this stuff can connect, how it can be. We also, I mean, Relatedly, we just ran a big survey. We surveyed people about their shipping habits. Um, we got 17,000 respondents, 16,000 of whom were, uh, were self-identified as people who shipped. Um, and I, more than half of them said that they shipped things that they didn't know or weren't familiar with the source material for. Right, so you have these just ecosystems of just fans talking to fans about other things, and it really does, the canon doesn't matter that much, and I think that's a little paradoxical for a lot of people in other kinds of fan, fan cultures to understand how, how just we're kind of cycling off and doing our own thing, basically. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to hear Justin or Craig responding to that, because I feel like both of you are, are in positions where maybe you, I don't know how much you see or don't see that sort of fan talking to fan bit versus things where fans are really trying to respond to what you're doing and support or yell at, you know, what you're doing, support or, or say, say give me more or, you know, go jump in a lake, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I, I actually, my rule, every writer on S.H.I.E.L.D. is different, is, uh, yeah, I, I don't really see the fan to fan communications. We see, you know, shout outs to us and our fans are generally very nice and kind of go with where we take them. But I try to disengage from that as much as possible because I feel like I serve the fans and it's, it, it's not a disinterest in the fans. I feel like I serve them best uh, if I just do what I've been doing and we've been doing what we do in writing the characters that we know really well and to not let anything else sort of get in our heads because people like our characters for a reason uh, and that's just because of the brain trust that created them and writes them and you will continue to like them, I think, if we continue to honor that. So again, it's not a disrespect or disengagement from the fans. It's, uh, it's quite the opposite in a way. Uh, I think that's how I respect the fans, by doing it that way. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that there forms any tension for that then, though? Because, I mean, there is so much emphasis on the idea of fans show your support. I mean, I know that's partially the premise of this panel, but I think it's true. I don't think it's just coming from, like, purely from the fans. The idea of fans show your support. Fans tweet at creators and tell us how much you love us. I mean, you know, again, I, Lynn, you've seen a lot of this also with Supernatural and the way that they've courted fan conversation and used that almost as a way to justify staying on the air, right? Is there a tension there, do you think? Anyone? <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I think there's a tension there. It, it's interesting because I, I came into fandom through the transformative works door. You know, I came in through fan fiction. So I fell in love with the show, but I fell in love with 
the fan community and the transformative works that were being produced at the same time. And that was a long time ago. Supernatural has been on the air for a long, long time. And I feel like in the beginning, there was a real dividing line between the transformative works in fandom and the canon that was on wherever you were in film or on television or whatever. And that really made a different sort of interaction between fans and creators. There wasn't a lot of tension because neither, you know, canon was canon and nobody expected that it was going to be influenced by really what fans were writing or what fans were imagining. And it, it seemed like that, you know, kept a lot of tension out of it. That's not the case anymore. There's, there's definitely more reaching out and there's more perception of reciprocity. And at the same time, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding on fans' part of thinking that what you're tweeting to someone or whatever is going to turn something around. <laughs> it's hard to, you know, I, somebody, I think Eric Kripke said to me once, you know, making a change to a show like Supernatural is like turning around the Titanic. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, oh, fans didn't like that. Okay, next week we'll do something completely different. That's not how it works. It's, it's like, interesting. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> it's a Canadian standoff. Um, just, it, it, very short. Uh, I think specifically Supernatural fans have, uh, and then their creators, that if we're talking about the tension between them, uh, I love what the creators have just sort of been like, y'all want to ship the brothers? Like, this is so uh, strange for us. We're going we're gonna to comment on it on the show. We're just going to do, that episode was life-changing for me as a fan to be like, Oh, there's a way that we can engage the creators. They can engage us without having to do the Titanic steer, without having to try to change anything. We can acknowledge that you guys want things we're never going to do, and we can tease it and have fun and with everybody it. everybody knew that. Nobody yeah. expected it to happen in exactly. canon. But I think it's just, it's a really, like, with the, the advent of social media, maybe Justin can speak more about this, I think it's really great that we are finding ways to communicate that don't disrupt the show, that aren't mean or negative, but at the same time are sort of acknowledging these two existing parties. Um, I was going to say... I think there's another degree that I feel is interesting to kind of watch as you're on social media a lot is something that I think is, is, has increased the tension is how easy fans can make it look and how social media can aid in that. Um, people can go and make a fan film or a fan music video or any expression of fandom that has good production values and they can market themselves as coming up with something that is equal to what people are spending millions of dollars on and they can do it in such a way because they're plugged into the fan community in a different way than creators usually are that makes it seem like, well, if these guys can do it for, you know, $1,000, <laughs> why can't you do it for $55 million? And it goes Sonic back to Hedgehog. that understanding. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it goes back to that divide and understanding that you're talking about, which I think all of them are labors of love, but they have different purposes. Mm -hmm. And if... Um, J. Michael Straczynski had a really good quote that I love, which is, all stories exist for a reason, but they don't all exist for the same reason. Um, going back to what I said about film, or I guess entertainment overall really being a business, the reason that that does exist is to sell things and to make money. The reason that a fan is going to spend their own money to make that, and this is a beautiful thing, is because they actually love the content that's coming out. They love the stories, they love the characters. But then the, the conflict that we're talking about, or the tension, like I said, comes when, okay, they did this, they did that, why can't you just kind of give me what I like? And I think that that's the role that social media has played in, I guess, fanning the flames of that divide, which is, it's so easy, why can't you just do it for me? Yeah, which I feel like is, uh, it's not the place of a fan to direct a show. I always get really weird vibes, especially because you have so many places where you can experiment and try to tell those stories, whether it's reading, you know, offshoots that are, you know, now officially canon or going to fan fiction or even just writing your own stories. Like, there's a million ways to, for you to engage in the characters that, again, aren't disruptive to the creators. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to hear what everyone on this panel thinks about, especially, you know, of course, Something's been, for instance, something's been off the air for a long time, right? Firefly is the classic example, not to put Delilah on the spot, but it's been off the air for a long time. People are really obsessed with it, and they really want more stories that are canonical. What does, I mean, what do you all think about, um, number one, sort of, I guess, the, the process of entering into that, right? If fans are, if, if people are saying, we want more canon, Right? What are the things that you'd like to know about that? You know, like if, for instance, imagine someone, someone's saying, like, here's a petition. This has been off the air for a long time. We want someone to write some novels or some comic books for this. What would be useful in that? 
versus what something that's better served saying, hey guys, like this isn't gonna happen, like go, you know, create your own thing. Is, is there like a, a wish list on that? Or, or, I mean, speaking from a fan perspective too, everyone, like what, what's useful and not useful in that, in that set of thinking? You're talking to me. I'm talking to literally anyone on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I feel trying like you to might throw be best it out there to answer. <laughs> and see what happens. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say, but I think uh, when a series ends and there are no plans to continue it in any other medium, for the fans to take over and create fan fiction. And then if that really takes off, somebody in the corporate side <laughs> of things will be like, well, hey, this fan fiction, people seem to love this we don't make any money from that, maybe we should uh, in-house start making books or comic books or games or things because, uh, and back to Firefly, I, man, I, you know, I'm sort of in with the Whedons and I still don't understand why there hasn't been more Firefly, uh, they did the film, but why- Joss was busy. Uh, <laughs> or some books or comic books, it seems like there's, because uh, the fans love it. I mean, remember the mob scene a few years ago when the cast got back together? Mm -hmm. um, but somebody somewhere has either decided no more, just let it be, or I don't know. It's a good question. So in my head, all of the shows and fandoms, I think of them as, as rigid as history, which is maybe why I've never delved into, into fan fiction myself, like reading or writing it, because to me, like Star Wars is history. That's as real as... as Herbert Hoover and William Howard Taft. Like that, it, it exists, it's real. And the thought that something in there wasn't real, I can accept in the same way that like, maybe we're not quite sure if King Arthur was real, but I still kind of believe in them. <laughs> so all of these things are very rigid and existent to me and all of the rules. And I, I see them as what, whatever was made is what, what we were given and gifted with. And that's what exists to me. And I know that there's this like secret, amazing world of things other people are doing, but I have trouble following because, because it's like history. So, you know, with, with Firefly, I would be so curious to see, you know, a, a like if I had like 30 seconds of omniscience, I'd be like, what do people really want versus what do people really need versus, you know, but I feel like um, because these characters, these, the creators are, are still alive and in control in some places like Joss has, I, I freaked out because I was like one day I realized Joss is reading my words that I made with my face mouth right now. <laughs> um, and it's terrifying because like he's, he's, we know he has some problematic aspects, but we also know that he's one of the most genius writers of the media we love, or at least that's how I feel. So yeah, it's, it's, I, I want him to be happy, I want the fans to be happy, but mainly I'm writing for me, for what I would want to see. Like these characters, I know them better than I know most of my family. And the dialogue, like I know what they're gonna say, I, I know what to tap into because I feel like I've watched each of those episodes probably a hundred times in the past 10 years. Um, so there's so much, there's a level of care that we all put into the things we love. And sometimes I know that what I would ask for is not the thing that I need or the thing that I would receive. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the hardest part is, you know, you, you can't give the fans what they want all the time because, I mean, it's, if, if you, cake is my favorite food. If you gave me a gluten-free cupcake for breakfast every single morning, even if it was the best gluten-free cupcake, about 432 days in, I'd be like, could I have some bacon? <laughs> because sometimes you need a salad. I don't know, it's, it's, it's such a hard divide, but it's all done with love. I think you, that you want to be surprised, too. I think if we were always given what we wanted, we would quickly become disappointed because what's great about going into a Star Wars film is like, what's going to happen? I mean, especially with this next one coming, you're like, I have no idea what to expect. I'm so excited. Uh, I think the, to answer your question, it depends on the fandom. So instantly I'm starting thinking about Avatar The Last Airbender, which I'm a huge fan of the series, and I think what Avatar gave us was... Um, for kids who liked dark material, which was definitely me, I liked dark themes as a child, and it was hard to find content that satisfied that. And then we got into LGBTQ themes. Um, we teased them in the first uh, arc, and then when we got um, Korra, we really went into it, and then the comics allowed a lot more than the censors for the TV show would do. And I think that that continuation of fandom was like, we hear what we were able to give you on air was just a taste of what the creators were hoping to give you. So much had to be inferred because Nickelodeon was like, you know, it's still a kid's show and we don't need a million moms constantly calling us. Um, and so I think that there's an opportunity out when you cancel a show or when a show has ended to go deeper into the themes that perhaps were restricted elsewhere. Can I jump in on that really quickly? And I think the other opportunity that comes up when a story that you really love or a TV show in this case ends 
is the opportunity to go back into that TV show and look at it differently. Yes. And honestly, to repeat that process as many times as you can, depending on how much you love the show. Um, I guess my example right now is Kings. It was a great show on NBC. I, I have no idea who you are, man, but the fact that you, lighted, that you lit up when I said that made me really happy. <laughs> um, 13 episodes on NBC. I truly think it's one of the greatest TV shows of all time. It's dense as hell, and I can't tell you, because I've lost count, how many times I've gone back through those 13 episodes just because I love the show that much. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if you love a story that much, that story travels with you uh, through your life. I keep quoting different people, and I have no idea who said that. I think it's Roger Ebert, but um, we bring our entire lives with us when we go to see a movie. The cool part about that is if you see that movie at 15, when you go back in, you're taking the, the next years that have passed in there and you see it with completely different eyes or through the lens of experiences that you didn't have when you saw it for the first time. And while I love the idea of continuing or going back um, as a fan and either creating your own content, there's usually a wealth of really good content that made you fall in love with that story in the first place. And I think that you're doing a disservice to the story by feeling like it has to continue on when you still have all of that to go back in and mine in a completely different way. And like I said, do it as many times as you can. It's great. And then talk to other people to see how they see it differently than you do. So just because it ends, I mean, God, now I'm looking at the title and thinking that I'm plugging it. Um, <laughs> just because it ends doesn't mean it's over. Yes. You know, it's, it's true, though. I mean, I, but I think they're two different things. It's interesting that you say that, the different perspective, because this summer, because Supernatural is going into its last season, a bunch of us on social media are doing a rewatch of the entire series, wow. which, wow. you know, that's 14 <laughs> seasons in three months. <laughs> I do have a job and a I'm family. And I, I think, I think I still do. I don't know. <laughs> is this um, Two hours for each season, it's, roughly. It's it's like three episodes a night. Oh, oh wow. my wow. god! And then and then live tweeting review them too. So it's, it's is there a hashtag we can follow this? Yeah. On? SPN Summer 2019. Let me just hop on that right now. Yeah. <laughs> Get yeah. into that. You'll see a lot of my tweets. <laughs> and I, I did it because I thought, well, you know, it's a big deal. The show is ending. I should do it, even though it's a big time investment. But what I wasn't expecting is that, you know, 14 years ago I started watching this show. My life was really different 14 years ago. I was a different person. So I'm seeing all of these episodes that I love the first time, but I'm seeing them completely differently now. And because I'm doing a little tweet review of them, I'm looking at them with an analytical lens and they're coming out so differently. So I think you're totally right. I think you can go back and rewatch a show that you love again and again and again and keep pulling different things out of it. But I do also think that there's, there's a real longing in fans for having more of the canon, more of the story. You know, you don't want to let the character go. You, I don't want Sam Winchester to be 38 forever. I want to know what Sam Winchester is like when he's 42 and when he's 57, and I'm probably not going to get that, but there's a longing for that. So I, I think it's two separate things. No, I'd agree. Elizabeth, you were making a real thinky face earlier. I, well, I was, it was really funny because I was just, I was like, so with you, and then you like pivoted, and I was like, oh, I'm not with him at all. So, so. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Fight, um, fight, I, I, fight, fight. No, no, I just think this question is interesting because I think it sort of presupposes, I know for you obviously aren't doing this, but like it sort of presupposes that, the, that fans want one thing out of canon, right? Um, like people write fan fiction often because they want emotional closure and like a reboot or a revival of a series or, you know, any sort of continuation may not give you that, it's, especially if it's made by the same people who weren't giving you the emotional closure in the first place. That's why you may need to create fan works. Um, you also may want the community that you had as you were watching it, and like a reboot may not, or a revival or any sort of continuation may not bring you that. People move on, people move to different fandoms. Um, and so I just think that there's more to it than this kind of idea of, oh, we just want more content from the gods on high. I think that's the way it works for some fans, but not for all fans. And I, I think we would do a great service to, to think about the multiplicity of, of approaches to especially the emotional. And, and then some people just want validation for their own ideas. And like as I'm, we've been talking about the Good Omens famine, uh, famine, phantom recently and people just tweeting their headcanons at Neil Gaiman and he's like, you're all right. And it's like, okay. <laughs> like, you know, people really want to, sometimes they don't, they don't want more, they want to be told that their reading is right and that's what a continuation is. And that's not gonna work in the long run because everyone is gonna have different reads because you bring your own life into it. So. I think it's complicated. 
We're not going to fight because I don't disagree. No, I'm, I wasn't disagreeing with you. It's just no, but I don't even think Justin and I disagree that much. I just, I, I just think there are there is a, like you know an affirmational, transformational kind of spectrum. Obviously, it's not a binary. And um, if if you're really into just getting more info, seeing the characters more coming from the same source, absolutely. Then I totally agree. But I, I think there are different kinds of fans. So, which I'm sure you agree with. <laughs> I do. Yeah, cool. Awesome, we're not fighting. <laughs> uh, man, I was really so hoping there was So as this question evolves, I'm thinking about how like, I have to, to do my job, I have to work within these rigid strictures. <laughs> like anything I do in Star Wars goes through my editors, it goes through story group, it goes through Lucasfilm, like there's layers. Um, but in my own work, I'm realizing like my first book, Wicked As They Come, was a steampunk vampire carnival romance that was yes. inspired yes. by a dream while I was rewatching Buffy. Yes. And I was like, what if Spike never did those terrible, th what if he was only good Spike before Spike did oh. the bad thing oh. and we could only have good pure Spikes? Like the main character is basically like if Spike was talking in a different body. And I have this series called uh, about Wake of Vultures. It's like a monster hunt that's like Buffy meets Lonesome Dove. And there's like, because I liked Deadwood and Deadwood went away, there was like, there was like a train town. And then, you know, I have, but, but there's books where like, I've, I've actually brought it back. I have a, a, a teen mercenary book where like, I really loved Boyd Crowder from Justified when Justified was over. And I was like, I want to write Boyd Crowder. So I made up that character. So like, I guess like, even, even like canon people, like we steal the things we love mm -hmm. to keep enjoying it. So it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sneaky secret way of doing that. I would say it's, it's about engagement, I think. For, the, for, for if you're gonna blanket term like how people get into uh, other types of fandom, it, it's this idea of, like for me, all fandom centers on culture, I guess. Like I, what I liked about Avatar was like my queer community just blossomed in it like it was just amazing to see people come into themselves to find themselves coming out via this fandom it was crazy um harry potter and a lot of kids with really tragic like early childhood memories struggling to try to figure out where they fit in and a lot of like ideas of chosen family and so i feel like those themes keep repeating no matter what the story is or where it's going or who you're shipping or you know how you change major events, it's those main core ideas that stay the same that kind of link all of us back into the fandom. This is kind of making me think about, uh, people talk about migratory fandom sometimes a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, uh, right? Uh, the idea that people get into one fandom, they make a bunch of friends there, and then everyone sort of decamps and goes and, and gets into the next thing. I just wondered, I mean, I'm, I'm being a really bad mod by just throwing out all these questions like chum to sharks or something. But does, I mean, I think some of you possibly have experience of this kind of thing where you're really into one thing and then you're into the next thing. Um, does that have some, yeah, Lynn, you're like, no, it's supernatural for the rest right or of, of my life. Monogamous. <laughs> <laughs> but does that play some part in this too? Is there something about like taking that community together that, that can be, you know, I like, absolutely think so. Like post Game of Thrones, there will be a small core group that is like, where are we getting our fix next? Like, Game of Thrones was like giant epic fantasy, but a movie every week, and it, it was incredible. Uh, just like, to, it's the, who's gonna forget they were alive during Game of Thrones? You know what I mean? Like, we came together on Sundays and we banded on Twitter and like we talked about it and we like dissected the books and we had you know, like it's so much like detail and time into just being an active participant in Game of Thrones. I want it for Carnival Row, but because it's probably gonna be binged on Amazon, I just don't think we're going to get that same kind of juice in it. And, and maybe we never get another like come together moment. I've heard a lot of people predict that. I think that would be sad. I don't want that for I wanna find another place where we can get together on Sunday nights and talk about something that is that rich in detail, that has that much history, that is that much commenting on us as a society. I think that those are vital moments, especially for people who I think tend to access fandom. We tend to be kind of like loners and weirdos um, proudly. You know, like we don't really like people, but like we like our people. <laughs> I love my Twitter community. I love that we're here under this roof for now. I love that we're gonna go back to our own lives and scatter and have these individual experiences that we'll come back together again and bring to each other. And I think that the sort of what makes fandom exciting and why it is able to exist so well outside of just the initial property um, because there are people living the stories like legitimately like you say you can watch one show over and over and over again there's something in you that's actively living through something that no longer exists that's crazy but it's, it's really cool it's it's almost like Frankenstein and reviving a monster <laughs> constantly um, he always looks a little different he maybe behaves a little different <laughs> um, 
but he's he's special and uh yeah, I know. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> no, it totally does. And I hate to, I, I really want to hear what other people have to say about this, but I just got the 10 minutes left warning, and I would love if we could get some questions from the audience. But I want to make sure that we can use a mic. So I don't know if there's a mic that we can use for questions or whether I should get people to come I got this. Here. I got this. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Actually, that's your mic. So you want to go, Nosley? <laughs> I'm so close to all of you. Okay. <laughs> I'm thinking about what Lynn said about uh, disenfranchised grief. Was that the term that you used? I'm sorry, what? Disen disenfranchised grief? Yes. Was that what it was? And I'm thinking yeah. about what you said about people using fandom and community to like process their feelings at the end of uh, like a, a series, at the end of a, a thing. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, like, what would it look like for, maybe this is a question for, for Justin and Craig, like, what would it look like for the powers that be to coach a fandom through the... The, the grief or the ending stages of this thing ending in it, it could be in a very corporate change management way. It could be in a very personal kind of, like more kind of uh, uh, interpersonal way. Like what would that look like? Would that be helpful? Craig, would Craig, that make Craig's you about to have the opportunity. Can I expand upon this question for you guys? Not to put you on the spot, but as the like firm, like a lot of you are on creator side actually, but like, like is, is there a way for that to exist when the studios and the content creators are moving on to the next project because they're not, it's ca hashtag capitalism. Like, like that's the part I would like, that's, that's the like needle I would like threaded here, right? Like why does it matter? Like do corporations actually care what fans think of this? Like yes, but you want them to buy the next thing? Like there's no more money to be made out of that, you know what I mean? It, it, Yes, and Sorry, first cynical. of all, I am so Talking many to that light mic. years removed Talking from the, the powers that be, but I can tell you, I manage marketing now um, for ILMX Lab at Lucasfilm, so I'm, I'm marketing minded, and my marketing philosophy is 100% zeroed in on what you said, Joelle. Um, you described an experience, um, coming together on Sunday night, getting into a show that had a rich history that informed not only that world, but the world around us, and really the sense of community that people built over time for that. Uh, not to be cynical, but I'm, I'm firmly of the mind that people don't buy the object, they buy the feeling. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question about could the powers that be, which again, I am light years removed from, um, <laughs> ever find a way to, and I don't mean to misquote you, but it, it almost sounded care enough to want to provide well, if, that if, kind if of... There's not, all right, so, so, there's, so for an example, there's no more Game of Thrones, right? So, like, and you're never going to recreate, like, if you offered another season, then you, you guys would be able to, the fandom would be able to do another round, right? But, like, if you're making Game of Thrones, what's the value to you? To, so con to, to continue to help people come down from having an incredible experience. Like, you've got to move on to the next show. Right? I mean, personally, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't. Um, I think that I think that's one of the beauties of social media is that community exists, the community is active, and that community is hungry to continue to have the feeling that you were describing. And if I'm thinking even further on, the Game of Thrones merchandise will continue to sell again long after that show is sure. over. Game of Thrones mobile games will continue long after that show is over. They're making a Westeros spinoff right now, like Game of Thrones, and I think to for that matter every more modern day property is cynically a gold mine that you can continue to go back to in order to make more money. But I think what a lot of corporations don't necessarily seem to understand yet is that there's a more 21st century mindset that is all about that community and that feeling. And by leveraging, not taking advantage of that community and giving them the feeling that they're looking for or really helping them to enhance that feeling, but without trying to take it over, you can continue to make a lot of money while still empowering the fans to love that property in the way that you're describing. I was kind of wondering whether this panel was gonna get around to the haha, -ha, no franchise is ever over anymore sure. uh, point. I think I saw, I, well, okay, I think there was a question there, yes, no? Someone in the middle there, no? Okay, and then- Shout you, it out, we'll repeat it on the mic. No, you I saw next, Would you? are you able to come up to a mic? Cool, it's just, you know, like the internet wants to someday see this, so. We're definitely not gonna get to everybody, I'm really sorry, but you can come up and talk to us after. Hi. Ask your question. Um, so I was curious, because you were, you were very adamant about you know, positive or negative social media um, you know, and fans. I wanna pose the question of Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you mess it up, because you got a reference, but they did. And um, fans took it into their hands, they're like, listen, 
it only took me this long. I know it's a complicated process, but I mean, what is your take on that when a fan sort of calls out something that you have a reference? <laughs> Um, I have a lot of feelings about Sonic. Uh, I don't know, not not even necessarily about Sonic the Hedgehog, because like I think it's bonkers to make a movie. Why he has a thin guy and a like fat guy? Whatever. We can get into all of the like nitty details of like it feels like a cash grab and doesn't feel like it, it came out of the fandom, which I think to your point is part of the issue. But I also think that again, as fans, we have to take a step back from this is what I want or this is what I was expecting to see and acknowledge that. By demanding they make all of these changes, that's 6,000 animators maybe having to go back into work. Maybe not, like animators already don't get paid very well. They're already working crazy hours. Um, this is going to negative, very negatively impact their lives for the next several months. It's, marketing has to go all the way back in and change everything. It's a huge overhaul for essentially a film. I don't think we're gonna like that much in the end anyway. I, I mean, just <laughs> honestly, like it's not, it's not a put down to the film or the filmmakers. Like, it's a Sonic movie. I don't think anybody, I've never heard uh, a strong, loud segment of the population being like, God, I need a Sonic movie. Like, I've just been dying for this. It's, I don't know, I don't think the market's out there. And what we were reacting to is this doesn't look good or feel good, and that's fine. But I, I also think that for a studio to say, gosh, fans don't like it, we gotta restart from the beginning. And, and knowing that studios are gonna cut corners and not take care of their artists, it's, it's a disheartening kind of back and forth. And I wish we would take a minute to acknowledge the people that are trying to bring us things that are good, who don't have final say. I'm sure the artists there were like, I guess, man, <laughs> if that's what you want, I'll draw it, but it's weird to me. Um, so yeah, so I, I think we just have to, we need to start being responsible. We have the option to talk directly to a lot of these people. I follow a ton of animators, people who've done three seconds, a minute of like Spider-Man, who that minute is beautiful and great, and it took them months and months of time. I can talk directly to them, and they can talk back to me, and I think that if we can engage those guys, the people who aren't at the top, who aren't the leaders, um, thank them for their work and try to be understanding about that process, that that helps all of us a little bit more. All right, I think that we have time for exactly one more question. And like, back there, you are dying. Yeah. No, no, come up, come up, Mike, please. No, 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 it's, it's for the sake of the video. <laughs> yeah, no, but it matters, I care. Also, someone maybe can't hear as well, it's right. fine. So, so here's my comment and my question. So, the comment goes something like this, which is to the point of sometimes fans need to rescue the content from creators who don't get it, right? <laughs> I have to say that that's partly what it, fans do. And I use the example of comic books in that respect, which is if Marvel or DC put out a, an issue that people don't like or the artists and the writers are going in a certain direction and the fans don't buy it, then they have to retool because the fans are giving them a message. And so my question to you is, what do you do as a fandom when somebody has taken a property and taken it in a way that as a fan base, you think is going off the cliff, right? Don't you have an opportunity to say, wait a minute, that's not what we want because we have a say now in terms of how we do things. My very first memory with television is Batman. I'm obsessed with Bruce Wayne and his Bat family and his dark childhood and his inability to access any emotion uh, to better help him self-grief. Uh, that shut down, like, everything about Batman was key and essential to my development as an early childhood. They put a gun in Bruce's hands and they wanted to light my hair on fire. I don't understand why you would give the one person who says I don't want to see anyone die a gun and send him into the desert to just shoot people at random. This does not make sense to me. I hate it. I hate the new Batman. I'm very vocal about disliking it. That being said, it really works for a different segment of the fandom. I don't think it's my responsibility to A, check a creator for bringing to life their vision and I don't think it's my responsibility to tell fans that they're wrong for enjoying something I don't enjoy. That being said, uh, I do, I, I remain vocal about, I think one of the principles that Bill Finger put into Batman was, I want to be better and that shooting people is not better. Um, but I don't think we can control what creators make. I think what makes 
comics specifically, but also fandom at large, amazing is that you can get multiple stories out of a single character. You can get different um, depictions. Reading Batman from the 60s is not like reading Batman from the 80s. It's not like reading Batman right now. He means different things to different people. We're projecting part of ourselves onto Batman uh, when we read or engage with him. And I think that, uh, that that's important. And so, no, I would never tell a creator what you're doing with this person is wrong. I will tell them I don't like it. <laughs> and they can do with that what they want. The studio can do with that what they want. Um, but, but yeah, you have a right to, to explore the stories you want. How I would write Batman is not how anyone else would write Batman, and I think that's what makes Batman great. All right, I got bad news. We got the stop sign. <laughs> I don't want to have the stop sign. You know, there's so many questions, so I think that I speak for everyone when I say that we'll, you know, go and chat with people <laughs> afterwards. If you liked this panel and want more, there's a few things that you can do, speaking of when things end, right? Okay, so we have a podcast, Fansplaining, and I hope none of these lovely panelists have been on yet, and I hope that some of them Do you guys want to come on? Yes. Do you guys want to come on? Yes. I want to talk to you specifically. I know you're going to try to So many questions. The rest of you, yeah? Great. Okay, so we're going to do that. We've also got literally four years of an episode every two weeks, so you've got a lot of back catalog to listen to if you haven't done that. Tweet about this panel. Tell people at San Diego Comic-Con you loved it. This is our first ever, so if it was good, like... Please let them know so that we get more. We get ones that are not at 7 p.m. and we get ones that are not like this far out. We want we want to like you know send them a message, and uh, that's it. I think. Thank you guys so much Thanks, for everyone. coming out.